Hello everyone, this is Dan Featherstone. I'm with the Pentair Training Institute. I want to welcome you to our uh, basic motor testing module here. This is a module that was uh, recorded earlier in August uh, and uh, it's kind of a supplementary to our uh, Meter 101. So I'm assuming you have a meter, you know how to use it, or you view the Meter 101 course and are familiar with how meters work. Again, I want to emphasize too that a lot of the testing I'm going to show you is power off testing. Uh, again, we're not trying to encourage you to go after the electrical side of it or to become an electrician, uh, but we would talk about some basic electrical testing as well. What I like to do is talk about how you can test a motor with no power on um, and, and concentrate on that, more so for safety, but also because uh, you can know a lot of good information by not powering up the motor even. You can just test the motor as it is and find out often what can happen. Before we get started, we do have our usual uh, little housekeeping items we like to get uh, taken care of. Uh, first, we always want to remind you we have the Pentier Learning Center. It's no charge for to anyone. Uh, if you go out to our websites at berkeleypumps.com or uh, if you go to stayright, sta-rite.com, under the resource tab, you'll see uh, on the left-hand side there's a link for uh, learning opportunities. Uh, and you can see more information there on these uh, the, the Learning Center, the webinars, and the live schools as well. The Pentier Learning Center consists of interactive e-learning modules that you learn at your own pace. We also have scheduling for like the live webinars, and we also have pre-webinars uh, recorded out there, which you can re review at your own time. Uh, also, if you'd like, we're out there on Facebook, so if you want to follow us there, uh, we're at Pentier Training Institute, where you can get our schedules for the webinars. Uh, for our schools and follow us there as well as we're hoping here to start publishing some white papers um, giving you more discussion and more in-depth discussion on a very specific topic for example cap start uh, versus cap run boxes uh, and stuff like that so keep tuned uh, we do have the Pentier dealer program like any company I know uh, in my wallet alone I have uh, different perks for say for example uh, McDonald's uh, and if you ever met me, <laughs> you know I have never met a meal I haven't liked. So I got like McDonald's, Panera, a few others. Uh, of course, like the mobile gas station. Every company has these programs, okay, is what I'm getting at. And, and if you're not taking advantage of them, you're leaving free money on the table. That's the way I view it. So if you're an installer, if you're a dealer, uh, if you're a distributor, make sure you look into this and see. And more importantly, as installers, uh, remember we have labor and extended warranty programs that you can take advantage of. So if you want more information, get out there at www.pentairprodealer.com. Uh, we also, for our dealers and distributors, have the Pentair Access Portal. Uh, that gives you 24 access to product availability, pricing, and order status, plus much more. If you'd like to get more information, give us a call at 866-880-3771. Finally, uh, don't forget our Pentair schools. We have uh, typically two of them offered in the fall and in the spring. Uh, one of them is the water systems covering residential and uh, uh, small irrigation projects. We also have the Ag and Industrial, uh, which will talk uh, about the larger pumps, of course, the Berkeley using the sizing programs, uh, variable frequency drive uses, and such. Uh, especially if, you're, if you like these webinars or if you like the Pentier Learning Center but you want more, or especially if you're a hands-on type of learner, get to the schools. Uh, we specifically structure them that we never try to go over 90 minutes of lecture before getting you at least maybe a half to a half hour to an hour or even a whole half day of lab time. Uh, so we very much try to get you uh, not just lecture but involved touching the product, programming it, taking it apart, etc. Um, so if you want more information, like I say, go out to our websites. You can even click the link to sign up for them. We hope to see you there. We're going to start talking right away, like I said, about motors and motor testing. And when we're testing motors, see, motors are, are made up very simply of, of a few pieces. One is they're made up of these laminates. And these laminates, when they punch them out, they'll punch the stator and the rotor out in the same punching. And these laminates, or this metal that they're punching, is a ferrous material. It's magnetic. And it's often proprietary to the motor uh, company uh, that manufactures them. Now, they're often about a 30-second in uh, thickness, and what they do is they take these laminates and they stack them. And depending upon the horsepower, they know how many stacks they need to put together. 
Now, I'm not going to talk about the rotor here or too much motor construction, but I want you to know what goes inside this stator is a winding. And the winding, even though it might be four pieces of separate copper or more, they really act and function as one complete piece of wire. Okay, so we literally have a winding machine that spins off the spools of copper and then they're pressed and placed into the motor stator. And that's what produces the magnetic field, which then makes the rotor jump and chase itself in that field. Now, when we're testing, we're looking at those wires. And like I said, think of them as really one continuous piece. Okay, now you'll notice in this picture these windings are brand new, they're beautiful, lacquer uh, is covering the copper, they're shiny, they're strings attached. You have the mylar that's protecting the stator from the actual uh, uh, windings from the stator, and, and it's beautiful. Now, if you've been in the business long enough or, or uh, you've heard me speak before, I always tell you, all motors run on smoke. You've probably heard that. Old-timers say that all the time. The minute you let the smoke out of the motor, the motor's dead. What they're referring to if something catastrophic happened to these windings, they become toaster windings and overheat, and they literally get so hot that they flash burn the lacquer and the strings right off. There's a poof of smoke because it happens that quickly, and you're done. Now, I, right now I'm talking about above ground pumps, but I will be talking about submersible pumps, but both of them share a lot of characteristics. Um, they both have windings. The problem is with a submersible is their epoxy coated where you can't really open them up and see them and look at them. But an above ground pump, I'll tell you, I usually don't measure the windings on a single phase motor much. What I do, and, and I'm not playing with you, is if it's an open drip proof, I, I shine a light in there and I see, are the windings still that nice copper? Or if they have overspray, is the overspray complete, not bubbled or blistered? Okay. And I look at the conditions of the windings. Are the strings still there? Do I still see all the strings in place? And yes, I smell it. A lot of people will laugh when I say this. I know. But anyone who's ever worked on motors, they'll tell you, if you think the motor has been burnt up, you take a good whiff, you'll get that burnt ozone smell. You can tell the motors, motors let the smoke out. So yes, give it a whiff. So look at it, and that, and typically when the windings are bad, it's a visual inspection. You can measure it, don't get me wrong, but what we're looking at windings now, you have your stator here, and this is just for demonstration purposes. I know it's probably there's a motor engineer out there cringing at my diagram right now, so I do apologize, but you'll have your main windings, okay? So you have your laminates that go in to protect the wires. The wires are then pressed in, one, two three, four, five, and six. That's your main winding. See there's a gap there? Well what goes in the gap is your start windings. One, two, and three. And what happens is that when you create a magnetic field the rotor in there doesn't freely want to spin. It, it's caught in this magnetic field and it's humming. What happens is the start windings with a capacitor come in and they come in at a different angle and strike that that rotor and that rotor literally jumps and then it all of a sudden once it jumps in a magnetic field well guess what now it's chasing the magnetic field and the rotor spins delivering energy and, uh, and workforce to the impeller or to whatever it's connected to so now once the motor started often these start windings will drop out of play that's called an induction run motor and often induction run motors are prone to harmonic, have a little bit of a hum to them or a noise. They're also lower torque often. And what it is is that they have to go from one, two, three, four, five, six, and then I'm counting clockwise here, starting at like a seven o'clock position, the red one. When it gets to the green portion, it has to jump because the winding is not active anymore. And so there's a little skip, and then it picks up on the other side, and the main winding grabs again, and it is back in the magnetic field. So it has this little harmonic to it, this little buzz sometimes. As well, 
you don't have that constant torque all the way around it. Now, the big difference between an induction run motor and a cap start cap run motor is just that, the capacitor. When you're using a start run capacitor run, the windings for the start side, the green windings here, stay in play. And a capacitor helps to uh, ease the load. And it then is running in the field. And so now the rotor sees a magnetic field all the way around. There's no skip. There's no buzz. And it has, more importantly, a constant force as it spins. So that's what our windings are doing. Now, you'll see that most motor windings will have, especially your submersibles, three wires will have the black, which is part of your main. Then you have your red, which is part of your start. And then your yellow is the interplay between the start and the main. It's the bridge, if you will. Okay? Now, here on the screen is an A.O. Smith Regal uh, troubleshooting card. And you can ohm out the uh, windings if you choose. Now, I'll say in my experience, the first thing I ask, what is the motor doing? And if the customer tells me there's voltage going down to the motor, but the motor's dead, she doesn't buzz, hum, do anything. First thing I would look is I'd visually inspect the windings. Okay? If the windings are fine, uh, then I'd look at the thermal overload, and I'll discuss that in a moment. If you want to ohm out the, the motor windings, you can definitely do so. Uh, like in this example, they're telling us that you want to read R times 1 between 1 and A and uh, A, L, L2 and A and L1 and A. Uh, so you can see on the card there, you can do that and they should be equal. I myself would tell you I rarely ohm out the motor. I usually look at the start components or look at the windings. If the windings are obviously burnt, their strings are burnt off, we know what happened. The, mo the windings are dead, the smoke got out. If the windings are good, let's look at the starting components and the back of the motor. Okay, now in the back of the motor, you're going to have a capacitor. That capacitor is typically black or brown, and it'll have two yellow wires and a white wire with a red tracer or a red wire with a white tra tracer going to it. If you look at the bottom of that capacitor there, you'll see those are the two yellow wires I was speaking of, and there's the white wire with the red tracer. First and foremost, before you touch the capacitor, a, remember, we're now talking power off testing here. We're not measuring voltage, so we have the power disconnected to the pump. B, capacitors are like a battery. They store charges, so you have to discharge it before you handle it. With an insulated screwdriver holding it by the insulated end, the metal portion, the blade, run it across like where the yellow wire and the white wire, those two terminals, run it across there, you might see a little spark, you might hear a little tiny pop, nothing big, but we're going to discharge it, so we now have it fully discharged, and it's not going to hit you when you pull the wires. Those terminals, like you see on the yellow wire, they're complete. Also understand there's no indication of start or motor. If I were to put the two yellow one wires on the top spade and put the white wire with the red tracer on the bottom, it would run the same way you can't miswire a capacitor. So don't worry if you pull out the wires, you don't have to remember how exactly how they go back together. Okay, what a capacitor does is it takes the energy from the motor windings and it sends a shot of that energy on demand down to the start switch and into the motor, into the start windings to make that rotor jump. Once it's jumped, the, this unit falls right out of play. Now, one of the yellow wires is coming from the overload. The other one goes to the motor. And then that red wire with the white tracer or the white wire with the red tracer goes to the start switch. And like I say, the only purpose for this capacitor, it's black or brown, okay, is that it is to start the motor and then be out of play. If it stays in play, if you're looking at the right picture with the yellow wire, right below it you see that little punch out there. Often the dielectric material gets overheated and it blows out. That's optimistic. I can tell you in my experience, I've been by capacitors even smaller than this when they go off. 
and it sounds like a shotgun shell or a pistol shot will scare the daylights out of you if you're nearby. And often that whole cap will be pushed right out of the plastic container. So that's what you'll often find. But if 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 you want to make sure, always check that little blow-up point because once in a blue moon, it does does work properly and it relieves the pressure quickly. And so you will find that puncture and you'll know that the capacitor is shot. Okay. Now when you're trying to test capacitors, you can do so with a capacitance meter. Um, if you listen to my meters uh, program, my meters 101, you notice that most multimeters now come with capacitance capability. And you want to make sure your meter can read at least 200 microfarad. If it could read more, great. But uh, I hate to see uh, you invest in a meter that can't read at least 200 microfarad. So now when we look at this here, we're going to hook it up. And we have our star capacitor, and the star capacitor can be plus 20, but minus zero. Meaning if it's an 86 microfarad capacitor, if it's 84, it's done. Don't. It might not be dead yet, but it's going to die out very quickly. Because it's going to stay in the circuit too long, and it's going to blow out the cap. If it's higher, that may not be a bad thing. But if you look at the top picture you'll notice that, first of all, that capacitor, if you look closely between the red and the black uh, alligator clips, you'll see that there's a resistor between the two. And when I do my microfarad testing, it measures 111, and that's an 86 rated microfarad capacitance. That's too high. That's over the 20%. But I'll tell you, it's because that resistor is in play. Often to measure um, the microfarads, you have to cut the resistor out of the circuit or solder it or uh, heat it up and solder it and remove it. Um, my easy answer is I cut it out. Now all that all that resistor does for the capacitor is when you turn off the power the resistor discharges the capacitor so it's inherently safe when you touch it. Don't think it doesn't instantly. If you turn off a motor don't right away grab that capacitor. You gotta give it a few minutes. In order to test accurately, we need it out of the circuit. Now, if you look at the lower picture, that same capacitor, now when I took out the resistor, it only measures 100 microfarad, which is in range. So actually, that one would work fine. We're not too worried about it. Now, would I solder back in the resistor? I'm 50-50 on that. My answer is yes, I would, because I know how to do it. I have a soldering gun. But if you don't do it, I'll tell you, a lot of start capacitors, in fact, your vast majority of them, don't have that resistor on them. So all that does is help discharge it. So that's why I always tell you, even with the resistor there, first and foremost, before touching the capacitor, discharge it with an insulated screwdriver. Now, we're all probably familiar with this old test. You break out your Simpson 372, you hook it up to the capacitor, and when you have it set up there to read properly, what it should do is the needle should go from the far left and swing over to the right, maybe three or four, and come down slowly. And then you reverse the probes, and it should go down to one this time and fall, slowly fall back to the left. And my answer is, I don't care. Because all that's doing is telling me the capacitor has the capability of grabbing and seeing a charge. It doesn't tell me at what microfarads is it returning the charge. That's why I prefer to have a capacitance meter because it's going to make sure the capacitor can hold the charge, but it's also going to give you an idea of at what microfarad is it going to return the charge. Okay. Too often I've had customers use this old test, leave the capacitor in circuit, and it causes an issue. Now run capacitors are usually oil-filled capacitors. They're often in a tin can, and they can be plus or minus 5% or 6%, depending upon the manufacturer. And they uh, also will have a little blow-up point, but they too, when they go out, they usually spill the whole top off, or they bulge and, and split on the side. These two go spectacularly, so they'll, they'll wake you up when they blow out, if you happen to be in the area. Now, because run capacities be, are plus or minus, as you see here, I'm measuring this running capacitor, which is rated for 35 microfarad. It's showing 34.9. I'm not worried. She's fine. Now, what is the run capacitor versus the start capacitor? 
remember, with a cap start, cap run motor, we keep the start windings in play, so we lessen that harmonic, and we keep constant torque on that rotor all throughout the cycle when it spins. Having a close-up, we have our, to our left there, we have a start capacitor. To the right, we have a run capacitor. Now, I want to point out a few things here that are obvious. There's your 86 microfarad plus 20% minus, minus zero for the start capacitor. For the run capacitor, you have your 35 microfarad plus or minus 5%. But the other thing I want to point out is if notice the start capacitor is rated for 270 volts AC, whereas the run capacitor is rated for 370 volts AC. A lot of guys tell me, Dan, we don't waste our time checking capacitors. It doesn't do us any good. And I'll tell you a good example why you want to pay attention to capacitors. We had a golf course. Every 18 to 20 months, like clockwork, they were replacing capacitors. They were also in a part of the country where they had 208 voltage coming in. And they were still trying to run 230 volt in some areas through buck boost, etc. So they have the voltage that is just irregular. As I would put it, it's cattywampus. You know, it's not right. And that voltage would vary. And what was taking the hit was often the star capacitor. Now, here's the point of the story. When you're losing capacitors, instead of saying, well, that control box, that company is a piece of junk, take a look at maybe it might be a voltage issue. And by getting your capacitor rated 86 microfarad, but for 370 volts or even 480, by going to higher voltage and putting less voltage in there, see, the higher the voltage, the better the installation material inside the capacitor, the more robust it is. So my point is, look at your capacitors, pay attention to them. If you're losing capacitor after capacitor, find the same rated microfarad, but go up in voltage, higher voltage, because you'll get better insulation and you might be able to save your capacitors uh, and maybe even eliminate that issue of capacitors dying out on you. And that's what we did with that golf course. We haven't heard back from them for quite a while. So my understanding is theirs is working fine. But often it's related to voltage, especially when you talk three-phase wide deltas. So don't ignore capacitors is what I'm trying to get at, especially when nowadays it's so easy to test them. You get your multimeter, you hook up your alligator clips, you get the reading, it takes you, what, 20 seconds? So it's worth taking the time. When you want to make sure that a capacitor is safe to handle, you're worried about it, break out your voltmeter, set your volt or your multimeter to volts DC, and measure across the points. You should measure less than half a volt. Now this one here, I left the resistor in play. With the resistor in play, it will zero out that and very nicely, that capacitor to nothing. If the capacitor is removed, now the glare, you can't see it, but that's that run capacitor again. That run capacitor has a little bit residence of voltage of 0.117, but it's less than half a volt. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be concerned about touching that capacitor then. But if you really want to test them to make sure they're discharged, that's the way to do it. We talked about a capacitor, and we know now the capacitor runs to my starting points. So I have, in this example, we have a governor, and we have a starting switch. And how these work is that when the motor is off, the governor's at rest, the springs compress, and pushes up on the starting points to make the starting circuit. The pressure switch closes, there's an inrush of voltage, the motor working with the capacitor excites and jumps that rotor and now it's spinning, it hits 2800 RPM and then the governor snaps open and the points break. If for any reason the motor, especially if it's an older motor, is going on and off, on and off because of the thermal overload, and how you can tell the difference between if it's the thermal overload or if it's a pressure switch, well, first of all, if you don't have a pressure switch, if it's a direct line, the only thing that would make a pump go on and off would be the thermal overload. If you have a control of the pressure switch, maybe a timer, I would take the cover off and examine those. And if the pump is going on and off, but my timer points or my pressure switch points are staying closed, 
then it's a thermal overload issue. Might be the points are, are damaged or dirty. Um, you know, if you remember the day, and I'm going to date myself, I remember my first car was a 1972 Chevy Impala two-door. And it had a thing called a distributor cap. And I remember my dad handed me a box of matches with a strike pad. And I said, Dad, I don't smoke. What are you doing? And he says, oh, just throw it in your car. You'll need it. And I, I didn't understand. I said, Dad, I don't get it. Why would you need it? And he says, well, it's simple. You have a distributor cap. Those points will get carboned over. So when you're, you can't get your car to run right and you think it's the points, take the distributor cap off, take the points off, burnish them up lightly on the strike pad of the, of the matchbox cover, put them in play. And sure enough, that worked. It worked often. Um, I, I, you know, I'll be blunt, you know, I was a young man that could only afford the cheapest car he could find, so I was always working on that car. Now, points, like for example, in your pressure switch, in your timer, and your starting switch are the same way. They will carbon over in time. They'll get build up. If, if though, you try to clean them and burnish them, one, don't use sandpaper. Uh, a lot of times what we recommend is a dollar bill and a little rubbing alcohol to burnish them up, uh, clean them up a little bit. And I know a lot of guys are saying, why are you cleaning points when it's just cheap just to replace the unit and not have to come back and do it again a year later? Good point. But if you want to do it for testing purposes, just to make sure that that's the part that needs to be replacing, clean them up quickly. But if you take the silver off, that's why you don't use sandpaper, copper to copper, when you run, run electric through it, they'll bond themselves together, they'll weld. You're done. So look at the points, start to pump, the points should break apart cleanly and stay apart until the motor turns off and reconnect. So we have our starting points. Now next we have that overload protector. And that overload protector, if the windings are still good, but no voltage is getting down to the windings, there's no buzz or hum, well, let's examine the thermal overload, okay? The overload protector has in it a couple of pieces. First, notice the wires. One wire is L2 power, which then goes to the terminal board, okay, and to the motor. Then there's that capacitor yellow wire, okay? Inside the thermal overloads, in this particular case, between the yellow wire and the white wire with the black tracer, or it might be a black wire with a white tracer, depending upon the motor, there's a heating element, literally. That little, you can't see it here well, but there, there's this little element that heats up. That if the motor can't start properly, it will heat up very quickly. And the other point in there is there's this little metal disc, and this little metal disc is by metal one piece of metal laminated to another and one piece of metal is rigid and pulls the points together if it's cooler than about 120 or so now these are not exact numbers but example numbers the other metal is reactive to 140 degrees and becomes rigid do you see what happens there you see if there's too much heat in the motor especially from that heating element from the start winding it heats up very quickly and it pops and clicks out and and will literally See, it heats up, and click, it stops. And if you ever remember, again, I'm going to date myself, but I remember as a kid, for Halloween, we always got these little pieces of metal discs that had the clickers in them, click, click, click. That's what this sounds like. It sounds just like those little Halloween clickers. You'll hear an audible click, and the points, and the motor will stop. If I measure with my ohm meter, with the power turned off now, again, the blue wire to the black wire with the white tracer or the white wire with the black tracer between those two points and I read open I know it's that thermal overload. Now depending upon how hot it got it could take 20 minutes or, or less but typically about 15-20 minutes it should reset itself and everything's cool and now you can measure continuity again or you'll measure resist you'll measure uh, very low resistance between the blue wire to the white wire with the black tracer. So that's what that overload does. Now, one way you can mess with that thermal overload right out of the box is if I put 115 into a 230 volt motor, uh, it runs differently through the motor and it's going to heat up that element very quickly and you'll hear the motor either will run half speed at best and eventually trip the thermal overload or 
it will run on and off very rapidly. And again, the pressure switch or the timer, whatever the controller is, will stay closed. But the motor is turning on and off very rapidly and it's brand new. Well, there I hate to tell you, we want to check and proof our voltage. If we think it's 230 and, and then we want to measure L1 to L2 and make sure we're getting 230 to the pump. If you only get 115 to a 30, 230 volt pump, remember it runs half speed at best and it will probably hit the thermal overload very quickly, go on and off rapidly. All right. So there's our thermal overload. Again, you have your point one and two. You will always measure uh, low resistance to unless they pop. Two and three is the heating element, and you should always measure something there as well. If that heating element is destroyed, and that's something you know you want to check. If it's an older pump, if that's gone, remember that's your startup protection. That if your startup winding doesn't open properly and take the capacitor out, it's going to overheat so you don't blow the capacitor out. And that's a clue. If you get to a pump that has the, the start capacitor blown out, if you're in the mood to change out the start capacitor, then you better check two to three to make sure that element's still there, that the thermal overload is still protecting the start circuit. Okay? Here's the side view. So the points are touching. You'd measure you'd measure uh, low resistance between one and two. If it's open, you'll read OL or out of limit. You won't or or a very very large number. Um, if, especially if you're using and that's where you don't need to use a mega ohm meter here this is a standard ohms meter r times one so if you're reading right it should read ol or when it's closed you should have uh, zero or or a very very low number like uh you know point something isn't as an alarming either okay so we have our overload protection finally the last piece to come and play is your terminal board now, granted, you probably won't see these types of terminal boards where you have to move wires or, or little plugs anymore. We now have that little dial mechanism. But your terminal board, that's where your L1 and L2 are, and that's where you measure power. Depending, too, if you want to measure the windings, this is also where you would do it to measure where you see, for example, in the main picture, A is clearly marked where you read L1 to A and L2 to A and compare the numbers and such to read your windings if you choose. Now, like I say, and I think you now kind of understand, if the motor's not doing anything, it's either the thermal overload or some windings are bad, okay? If it's a thermal overload, what's making the thermal overload trip? But often the motor will run. If the motor is buzzing, humming, or doing something, it's probably one of the other components you want to check at, your start capacitor, your starting points, or maybe the motor's bound up, something like that. But if the motor is making a humming noise, that tells me the windings are still there trying to move the rotor. Now, when you're doing live voltage testing, L1, L2, I want to caution you. See that area right there? That is A on the new terminal board for the Regal Beloit pumps. It's also live voltage. So if you're in the habit of holding your, your probe set very low, with your finger or your forefinger, I've had customers say they've accidentally touched that. So I caution you, when you're doing live testing, one, as you can see, there's terminals there on L1, L2 that you could easily use your alligator clips to connect to so you don't have to hold anything. If, however, you're going to hold on to the probe set, remember your PPE, your personal protective equipment. Wear your personal protective equipment, your insulated gloves to protect yourself, okay? Uh, one thing I always say, and if you've ever heard me lecture, I always ask, who do you really work for? People will say, oh, I work for this company. You know, I would say, foolishly, oh, I work for Pentair. And here's the real answer. I do work at Pentair. Pentair is a very good company, and they reward me well so I can take care of my family. And that's the key. You always, you work for your family. You work for yourself. So when you cheat safety, you're only cheating your family and yourself, okay? So remember that, please. Now, the other thing to point out is if you notice, this is a dual-voltage motor. So if I need to run 115, I take a half-inch uh, pliers or a half-inch wrench, I'm sorry, and I give it a counter-turn counter counterclockwise. It firmly clicks into 115, 
and I'm good to run 115. Now, a few things I want to point out. Read the motor before you connect it. Half horsepower motors, depending upon the manufacturer, might be 115 only. Any dual voltage motor goes out preset 230. Because what did I tell you on the previous slide? If I put 115 into 230, it's not going to destroy the motor. It will run half speed, it will trip the thermal overload, but I'll have time to save the motor. If I assume that half horsepower motor is 230 volt, but it's only 115, and I connect it to 115, 115 makes toaster elements out of the winding. It superheats them, it lets the smoke out, they're done. So if you put 230 into 115, shame on you first for not checking your voltage. It's not a warranty, because when you bring it back to, to us, we're going to look at And that's where one, I'll tell you point blank. That's one very well. Look at the windings and take a whiff. You'll smell they're burnt. You'll see they're burnt. So that's very obvious when that happens. So do be careful. All dual voltage motors come pre-wired 230 because that way it doesn't damage the motor. If, you're in a, if the customer tells you it's a 115, and don't assume a 115 outlet is only wired 115. I've had too many students tell me that people get creative and they've put 230 going into 115 outlets, but they don't mark it. So never assume. Be careful. When in doubt, check the main power supply. Look to see if there's two, if there's two breakers or one breaker. You know, double check. Get your voltage meter out with your PPE, your personal protective equipment, and measure the voltage. Proof it. The back here. We're showing you all the components as they are with the Regal Beloit motor, the smaller horsepower motors. Okay. If you're measuring for ground, if you want to proof your ground, there's your ground or the frame of the motor itself is a great ground tube to test to. And you would test it to each point, L1 and L2, maybe even touch A. And you're going to measure with a mega is a good idea or with a meter that can read at least 20 million ohms. And you want to see big numbers, big numbers. Now, what I mean by that is... When, uh, when you talk above ground motors, you want to talk to the motor manufacturer and find out what they recommend. Now, for example, Beldor. Beldor wants to see each leg to ground better read more than 5 million ohms. They want to see big numbers. If it's less than 5 million, they'd be worried that the, the installation has been compromised. Now, if you don't have those numbers inf or this information available, uh, as an electrician, I've talked to a few, and the general rule for electricians is they take the uh, voltage plus one. If it's 230 volt, they want it to read 2.4 million ohms or better. Or if it's 115, they want it to read 1.16 million ohms or better. They do that as a general generic rule of thumb. I'm not a big fan of that. But if you just are you're stuck and you can't find information, that's that's what I've heard from electricians. My my honest best answer is refer to the factory. I would try to get a hold of the company uh, of the manufacturer of the motor, and find out what they recommend. Okay. Now submersibles are different, and we'll talk about submersibles here in more detail. Now here's an example where I have my meg ohm meter set up. I have my one probe wired up to the frame of the motor. The other one is measuring the L1 in this example. And you'll see that I'm measuring greater than 2 giga ohms. And I'm also putting down 1,016 volts DC to do this measurement. So this motor, which has never seen any sort of workload, um, this is a sample motor I have in my lab, I would expect the installation to be perfect. And that's exactly what I would expect. Okay? Three-phase motors have three windings, and basically a T1, T2, T3. They often have the three coils called U, V, or W, and they're offset by 120 degrees. Uh, so you don't need a start winding. They have no start winding. you also notice they have no overload. Remember when you deal with a three-phase motor, be it above ground, below ground, submersible, you know, centrifugal, you have to add protection. Okay, and, and there's different degrees of protection depending upon the job site, and, and, and uh, ambient temperature can be a factor, all of this. So that's why they're sold separately. If you don't put protection on them, shame on you, 
uh, you're running that risk every time you run it. So make sure you always have that on there. Now, you have your three windings. How do I measure windings then? You wire it up either 460 or, or 230, however you're going to run it. And you measure each set of windings, U to V, V to W, W to U. Or T1 to T2, T2 to T3, T3 to T1. And when you measure them with an ohms meter at R times 1, they should measure the same. Or very close. Now in this example, I did it purposefully. You may see 1 and 2 measure 11.1 and 11.1. And number 3 measures 11.2. Am I really concerned about a tenth of a ohm? It could be how the wires are clamped together. It could be how well the wires were were uh, uh, twisted together. So there's a lot of factors there that you might be off a tenth or so. What I don't want to see, and what often is the cause, is when you drop a phase in the motor. A three-phase motor, um, first of all, they're a dumb machine. And they're going to try to do the workload no matter what. I kind of jokingly compare it to my faithful my dog, Carmel. Carmel's a little beagle mud of ours that we have. Great hunting dog. And, and she loves being out in, in the woods and running down uh, rabbits and such. I think if, if I let her, she would run herself to death to make me happy. And, of course, I wouldn't let her do that. I take very good care of her. But motors are that way. Motors are going to try to do the workload as faithfully and as hard as they can. And if you don't put thermal overload protection on them especially, you'll burn them out. Now, what do I mean by single phase? What's the point of this story? What it is, is says simply this. You have three windings, I told you. Three live wires from the power company come in. Now, say one of them is on the wild leg from a wide delta and the voltage is varying. Or worse yet, there's a storm and one of the transformers is damaged. So now one leg is weak. So it's not running properly. So the other two, because they have a good power supply, will often try to grab the power and increase the amp load to make up for the difference of the third leg. And they will do so until they burn out. And just like I said before, once they let the smoke out, those two windings let the smoke out, they're dead, they're done. But the third one... That single phase looks pristine often. You'll take out the motor and you'll see one winding looks fine. That's referred to as single phasing a motor. And when you measure, you'll measure, for example, from the good winding to the bad winding, you might get a measurement. It might be 42.7, but it'll be out of whack. The next one, you'll measure, again, one good winding to the bad winding, and it might measure close. It might measure like 44 point something. But then you measure the two bad ones, and you'll get maybe very little reading or a huge, maybe uh, 600 ohms. Uh, but that tells you you single phase the motor. Again, if you look at the windings and you take a good whiff, you'll smell it and you'll see that it let the smoke out. So when you're talking three-phase motors, the windings should all measure roughly the same. Okay, That's the key. Now, should what's the range? Is 11.1 appropriate for this motor? Well, I would have to call the motor manufacturer to be sure. So that's the other thing, that if a motor has a good number of years on it, remember the windings will just naturally break down from usage, from heat, cooling, and, and uh, uh, from you know being hot and cooling, expansion and contraction will break down the winding insulation naturally. So if you want to know for a centrifugal motor, you typically need to contact the manufacturer. Can you test for ground? Absolutely. You test each each winding to ground or the frame of the motor. Here you can see the black alligator clip is connected to the motor frame. The red alligator clip is connect, connected to one of the windings. I hit my mega ohm meter test button and it's putting out 1016 volts DC and again more than 2 giga ohms. Because that motor I can assure you has never seen any sort of work done to it. Uh, it's never seen any real current put through it. Now, if you have to do live testing, one good way to do it if you're nervous about ele electrical connections is to do it with an amp meter. Now, remember, an amp meter has a true clamp uh, reading to it, way to read to it. 
Uh, don't mistake your multimeter as an amp meter. If you use a generic multimeter, it's only rated for up to 10 amps, and that's typically DC. Plus, you have to cut the circuit and put the clips in play. It, it, don't do it. Get a meter that has the clamp-on style. So you can then put the, the wire or the meter uh, over the wire, activate the pump, and you'll get an amp reading. Okay? And you'll get a proper amp reading. You won't have to worry about the inrush current damaging your meter. So when you get that reading, you then want to compare it. Now, for an above-ground pump, they often have it nicely printed right on the pump. So in this case, I look at my label, and I see it's 2.3 slash 1.15. Well, the first number is for 230 volt. The second number is for 460. Now, also note that's max, max load amps. To get the full service factor amps, you have to take that 2.3, because we're doing 230 volt testing here, uh, and we're going to multiply it by 1.3 service factor which tells me that that max load amps of 2.3 the service load the service factor amps is actually 2.99 okay and that's how you would determine now I'm gonna warn you don't be alarmed if you see the pump is running say 2.7 2.7 amps yes it's over the maximum load amps but it's not over the service factor amps of 2.99 and I'm not going to say that it's just one company. All pump companies load right into the service factor often. It's not uncommon, so don't be surprised. As long as you're not going over the service factor amps, you're fine. If you're going to measure voltage, you can do so at L1, L2. If you're not getting voltage down there properly, then what I do is I work my way backwards to the main power supply, meaning I check at L1, L2. Then I look at the controller. Is it a pressure switch? Is it a timer? Is there a disconnect switch? And work my way back to see where I'm dropping voltage. In my experience, it's often the control. Remember, pressure switches and timers have points and they carbon over. They often then will stop passing voltage properly. So always check those. Now, if you're not comfortable using uh, a meter to check voltage, Remember, try to use alligator clips. There's even like little J-hook clips that, that will hook the wire nicely so you don't have to hold on. If you do have to hold on to your probe set, wear your PPE, your personal protective equipment, insulated gloves, okay? Now here in our lab, uh, my partner here, you can see that he's doing a few mistakes. And I like to leave these pictures in there, not to embarrass anybody, but to show a few things. Now, first of all, okay, in a pressure switch, it's very typical that the two outer screws will be your incoming power, and then you want to measure the two center screws, making sure the points are closed to see if voltage is being passed properly down to the motor, okay? Because if it isn't, say you're measuring 230 on the two outer screws, and you measure the two inner screws, and, and there you're measuring something goofy like 160, we know the pressure switch is bad. Now, also look closely at this picture, especially the bottom picture. You see his forefingers are touching. Remember that saying, and if you haven't heard it, I have a saying, one hand in pocky, no shocky. As electricians, we were taught when dealing with live voltage, you know, keep one hand out of the way. We were even taught that if you're working in an area that you might encounter voltage, to grab the back of your work belt. Why? Because when you touch live voltage, your muscles contract. And especially the hand that's touching a live wire can't let go easily. And if you're foolish enough to touch it with your palm rather than the back of your hand, if you touch a live wire with your palm, your, your hand can contract around the power source. If you do it with the back of your hand, the hand will contract away from the power supply. Okay. So first of all, don't be touching power supplies. Okay. But if you're in an area that you're not sure, get your PPE on, your personal protective equipment, Use alligator clips if you have to hold the probe set, okay? Make sure you have nothing touching that is not protected, meaning if those probes were bad and they had a voltage leak or they were damaged and they are allowing voltage to come out of the insulated handle, by touching his two fingers together, he creates a circuit across his heart and he could be killed. I won't, I won't sugarcoat it. So always, always, always treat electricity with respect.
I know some guys, when I go out in the field, and they're asking me to help test, and they watch me put on my insulated gloves, and they're teasing me. I don't care. Tease me all you want. I want to go home every night. Meg Ohms, when you're talking about measuring insulation, you know, that good old Simpson giving you 20 million ohms, it only put out about 30 volts. If you really want to test insulation properly, you, you, you got to get a Meg Ohm meter. What a Meg Ohm meter does, simply this, is it pressure tests the insulation. Comparatively, in our, in our industry, plumbers, for example, when they plumb a home, before they start applying water, they put a Schrader valve in line and they air charge the plumbing system. And they often overpressurize it, maybe 100 PSI. And then they wait a few minutes, or whatever the code tells them to do, and see if there's any drop in air pressure. Okay? They do this because they want to make sure that the system is airtight. If it's airtight, it's obviously watertight. So that's how they test it. Electricians do the same thing. We take a mega ohm meter and we'll put down a thousand or five hundred volts and the rule is you look at what voltage that should be carried by the wire. So if it's a 230 volt wire it should be 460 to 525 or 575 if I'm doing my math, math right voltage test applied to it. Meaning that two to two and a half times that 230 volt. So I would set my mega meter to, I would just go right to 1,000 volts DC to test the wire. And what we're literally doing is we're sending down a large voltage, very, very little amps, but large voltage to pressure test the installation uh, and the insulation and the windings of the motor. It checks your splices. It checks everything if they're in line. So that's what a mega ohm meter is doing is it's checking how well the electricity is protected from getting out and going to ground or somewhere worse. Now, this meter here is a fluke. Uh, I don't want you to think that, you know, I, I'm trying to promote one meter over another. But fluke uh, is an industry standard, and they do a very nice job that when you look at this picture, you'll notice that everything to do with insulation testing is coded in orange. So you know what buttons and what settings to have. You'll also notice that that red probe set, it's got a three-prong system where you can only plug it into one portion of the installation test, and then you have a nice negative or, or your other black probe set has the alligator clip already installed. It also, they give you the option where you can do the installation test by pushing the probe set button, okay? Which, especially if you're doing like DC work, very small components, that's great. I myself would just use an alligator clip on the red one and push the red or push the orange insulation test button to do the test. But you have to know how to read your meter and how to you work your meter. That's my point. So Fluke, they do a nice job and other companies do the same thing. I'm not just saying Fluke is the only one. So we want to set it up. We want to set up our meter to read our, our insulation test. We set up our voltage output to 50 or 1000 volts to test and then when we have our wires and our probes all connected properly we push the button we send that voltage down and we get a reading here we're reading 53.7 million ohms test voltage was 1050 volts DC okay if anybody knows or you know knows me or uh, has heard me speak I was careless, and I lecture you guys not to be careless, and, and I was careless, and I lost my meter. I lost my nice fluke. I had to go back to my boss and explain, hey, I lost the meter. And his answer is, well, that's not great, but if you're going to replace it, let's buy one that's affordable to lose again. He had that much faith in me. Thanks. No, he, he's a good boss. But I did. I, I, I researched. I said, you know what, there's got to be an alternative because my budget can't take, you know, a big hit losing a, a fluke meter, even if it's once every two years. So I found this meter on good old Amazon. Uh, it's made by Mastec. But the point is of this one, if you notice, there's no color coding. So you have to read and know how to use your meter. In the picture to the left, it shows you that the two red ones to the left are for testing of insulation. It doesn't give me a red or a black. So then I hook up my meters, I then set my dial to filter 50 to 1000 insulation, set my range, and then I push my test button to test. So now I have my meter set up and ready to go.
I then connect my wires, I push the test button, and I'm putting out 1,028 volts DC, and again, over 2 giga ohms of resistance. Now, if you look carefully at the picture on the right, you can see that the wire is probably about 18 inches long. It's a brand new wire I cut off of a spool just to test, uh, to show you. And uh, yeah, I hope I have a lot of insulation in a brand new wire that short. So that wire is perfectly good. But that's how you test. Now, if you're testing a pump motor, you would test each lead. You could do each lead to ground that way, as we showed earlier. Or if it's a submersible, you are testing the wires above ground before you're pulling the pump. One of the things I often hear a lot of people tell me is, well, you know, I like those analog meters, but you just can't find a mega ohm meter that has an analog function. Guess what? I went right out to Amazon.com, and within two minutes, this particular unit popped right up, and I purchased it. It's, again, you, you can see it's not color-coded, but it tells you, if you read the instructions, how to hook it up. It tells me the black probe goes to earth, the red probe went to line. I then set my installation test. This one, I set it to 500. I'm still testing that little 18-inch piece of wire that I did in the previous slide. So I push my test button. I'm sending down 500 volts. But if you notice here, it doesn't tell me what the exact voltage is going down. You'll also notice that the top black scale is for million ohms. And you notice the, it's not even moving. So it's reading more than 200 million ohms, which knowing from the previous slide, knowing that the uh, Mastec one I showed you, the digital, showed more than 2 giga ohms, yeah, this analog one, I would expect it to stay at two, 200 million and not move either. So, okay. Now, the one thing about these meters, if you look at this one, you notice it's also a voltmeter and an ohm meter. When I'm reading ohms, the color code where it says continuity and ohms, I read the green scale. But what's odd is if you look at the insulation test, the insulation test, it's a red portion, but the red scale correlates to AC voltage, which is blue. So that's where you got to be careful and know how you're reading the meters, okay? Insulation testing, so for submersible, I'm above ground, and I would test each lead to ground. So I have my green wire, I would hook it up. If it's a two-wire, I would hook it up to both leads, It'd be it both of them are black or one's red and one's black, but i test both. Then it, if it's a three-wire, I would go ground to red, ground to yellow, ground to black, and I would take, check each one. And I want to see big numbers. Now, this is a brand-new motor uh, that I pulled out of stock, and in this test, I'm measuring the uh, green to black, it's measuring more than 2 giga ohms again at 1,018 volts DC going through the system. So this motor that has never seen uh, any usage, yeah, the installation is picture perfect. But any company that builds 4-inch motors, now we build the Pentec, Gould builds the Centra Pro. Remember, essentially, they're both the same motor from Faraday, but we each will have a motor handbook that tells you what numbers should read uh, when you're testing ground and such. We call ours the electronic manual or a PN793. Um, Franklin, if you're familiar with Franklin, they have the Franklin AIM manual. So every motor manufacturer has a book that's going to tell you what it should read. For submersible pumps, because they're in groundwater, we go lower numbers. So anything over 20 million ohms is considered a brand new motor. Anything over 10 million ohms for us is considered uh, a used motor measured outside the well that's dry. You can go as low as 500,000 ohms, which if it was an above ground pump, they wouldn't go that low. But remember, if they leak any voltage, it's going to go right to the frame of the motor and it's easily touched. Here, we're grounding in groundwater, so it's properly grounded. So these numbers here might be a little lower than you expect as compared to an above ground. So if you're measuring 500,000, that's typical of an older motor. When you get to 200,000 ohms, that's typical of a motor that's seen better days and I would probably want to replace it. If you're only measuring 20,000 ohms, that 20,000 20, ohms, yeah, that motor has took, taken a hit. 
the damage to the windings or to the insulation has been compromised, do not energize it, okay? Especially, if, I'll be blunt, if it's under 200,000 ohms, I would be very hesitant to energize it again, okay? So we measure resistance above ground before we pull the pump through the wires. With a submersible then, we can measure, and, and here I'm showing you again, meg ohm test, I'm measuring the yellow main to the ground. Now this is an older motor uh, that's been tested, but I've never installed it. Again, I'm measuring greater than two giga ohms. Now I let go of the test button here, and I wanna show you that a lot of units, they will, if you wanna know how much voltage it's putting down, you have to keep the test button pushed. A lot of units have memory, so when I let go of my button, you see it shows zero volts AC because the t or zero volts DC because the test is over, but it still shows that it tested better than two giga ohms. So I just want to let you know uh, if you want to see what voltage is being tested uh, with a mega ohm meter, you got to keep the button pressed so it's applying that voltage so you can read what that voltage number is. Ohm's resistance for the windings then. So now we want to test our windings. Okay, and we're going to break out our, our R times 1 meter. And you can use the Simpson analog or you can use, you know, digital, whatever you prefer. I always like to stick with the digital multimeter, but that's just me. Um, and what you're now going to set it up for is to read true ohms or R times 1. And you're going to get a number. And if you remember back in the beginning of this uh, discussion that I told you, we know how many turns and how much wire goes into every motor okay and we know a pretty precise number of resistance you should have so just for round numbers just because I'm not good at math I'm gonna say you should be measuring 5 ohms then they give you plus or minus say 10 percent so then I should be able to read a range of 5.5 to 4.5 if I did my math properly okay so that's how we get this range. If you're ever wondering what the range is and how it's determined, it's given a factor of maybe 10%, 15%, whatever the manufacturer is comfortable with, compared to what it should read accurately. Okay? And the reason they give that range is, one, is that nobody's perfect. When these motors are made, solder can be uh, a little sloppy or might be done perfectly, and the numbers can change. The wires might have a little bit of... of um, exposed wire or exposed lacquer to it you know things happen in manufacturing that will change that number a bit so they know where it wants to be by reading now between a, in this example a two wire we're reading the two wires that are exposed that, that energize the pump but what we're really reading in a two wire pump is we're going down one side to the start winding through the start winding to the yellow common that connects the start and the main, into the main and out. So we're measuring the whole winding complete. And we get a number. And that number we then compare to what we should get. And we go to our uh, AIM manual, our PN793 electronics manual, whatever manufacturer's motor you have, you want to refer to their book. And I look at my two wire pump, half horse, because I know this one's a half horse. And I get a number of 6.1 to 7.2. And on that previous slide, I was reading 7.2. So I know that motor is reading fine on its main winding resistance. Now, a lot of people will ask me, what do the numbers really mean, Dan? I mean, what if they're high? What if they're low? First, I want to tell you this. And I haven't heard it in years, but I remember one year I heard some students talking that there's this magical formula that if you take the difference, and say you're reading 10.2, and it should read 7.2, and that's a difference of 3 ohms, and you multiply it by this magical number, which I don't even remember anymore, that would tell you how many hours are left on the motor. And if you believe that, hey, I got a bridge to sell you. Don't buy into it, okay? It, it, it's not legitimate. There is no magical way to tell someone that this motor has this many hours left on it. No. Now, can motors operate outside the ranges of what they should be? If I'm measuring 7.7, for example, would that motor still possibly run? Yeah. But it might 
be nuisance tripping. Uh, for example, the customer might say, hey, you know on, on Saturday when I, it's laundry day, every time I get to the third load, halfway through the damn pump stops on me. But if I give it an hour, then I can do another three loads, but again, it keeps stopping on me. Okay, that's probably because the motor's getting hot. We know that. All right, now, that's what these numbers can kind of tell you. If the numbers are low, if I'm supposed to read 6-1 to 7-2, and I'm reading 5-8, or, or worse, I'm reading 2.4, that's a very low number. Often, that's telling me that things are melting, that the insulation is, is gone, and now the electricity has an easier path. And it could even be the stator itself. It could even be the shell of the motor housing. But the electricity is flowing easier now because the insulation that kept it confined is now, now missing or is now damaged. Often, when you pull the pump out of the water, and these mo motors are stainless steel. When they're low numbers, it often means the motor's getting hot and the motor all the way around will have this purple or blue band often all the way around it or a good portion of it, showing you where the insulation is worn and it's creating some heat. Or, better yet, it could be that it's showing you that, for example, you put a 4-inch pump in a 4-inch well, it will fit. But what if that well has you know, maybe a bend to it, and now part of the well casing is touching the motor casing, and so, you know, you're not getting flow across the motor there for cooling, that can cause things to do this, and you'll see that discoloration to one certain area. Now, what if the motor, the resistance windings are, are high numbers? I'm supposed to measure on the high end 7.2, and I'm measuring 10.1, but somehow the motor still runs every now and then. Okay. First of all, when you're reading high numbers, that means higher resistance. That means that the wires are thinning or are broken or the splices are separating a bit. And the wire is, is, is forcing its way through that obstruction at more forceful resistance. Now, I even said I had one customer that they forgot to crypt the bunk connector and then the wire stretched and so the, that the wires were just barely touching. And what we found out when we took apart the splice, you could see burn marks all around there from arcing. And I know one guy told me, he said, oh, that's it. I, I think you're just telling stories. Electricity doesn't jump. And he started just really laying into me in, in the middle of one of my sessions. And, you know, I'll take only so much before I finally push back. And I said, sir, so you're telling me electricity can't jump. And he said, yes. And I said, so you walked here, right? And he says, what does that, what are, you, what are you talking about? And I said, well, you walked here. He says, no, you fool, I drove. And he said, no, sir, you walked here because according to you, electricity doesn't jump. That means your spark plug would never work. You see, when wires get damaged, they can thin. They can even separate. You can have splices where, where the splices, you don't, you don't crimp the butt connectors, and the wires are just loosely in there. And sometimes they're making a good connection. Sometimes they're not, or they stretch, and now they're barely, barely inside the butt connector. So these things happen. But when you see high numbers, that tells me that the wire condition is bad. Now, here's the thing about a two-wire pump. We're only measuring two wires. I can't tell you if, it, if, if you're measuring high resistance and you're suspicious of a splice. I can't tell you if it's number one or number two because we measure through both of them no matter what we do. And I'll explain that. Now, let's look at a three-wire pump. A three-wire pump you're going to measure red to yellow, which is your start. Remember, in the beginning of the conversation, we talked about that. And you're going to get a resistance reading for the start winding. And in this case, it's 18. Then we're going to measure yellow to black. And guess what? I got you a bad motor. I know you were asking, what does a bad motor look like? Well, here's a bad motor. I'm measuring yellow to black. My main winding is measuring 218.2 ohms. Yeah, she's dumb. Okay, we know it. I bet you this motor would not start no matter what we did. Okay, so now we look at our good old uh, factory manual. So when in doubt, always go back to the factory manual. And on the bottom of this chart, I have it highlighted. It will explain to you again 
Start winding is between the yellow and the red, and the main is between the yellow and the black. So if you have a question, just read the manual again. Okay. If you look here now, you're going to see that the cap start induction run half horsepower motor should read 12.4 to 13.7 for the start resistance and 5.1 to 6.1 for the main resistance. And for both of those, we're reading high. But we're reading highest on the main, which probably tells me something spectacular happened on the main. Now, if we have a cap start cap run control box, your resistance windings are, oh, the same. The only difference between a cap start induction run and cap start cap run is amps. That's why we separate them. But the motor themselves are identical. It's just, do we want to keep the start winding in play, or do we take the start winding out of play? Cap start cap run keeps it in play. Cap start induction run takes the start winding out of play. Cap start cap run runs lower amps because all the windings are sharing the workload. Cap start induction run that the head does not have a run capacitor puts all the workload once it's started on the main windings, thus it has more amp draw. And we'll look at that chart in a minute. But I want to point out resistance is resistance in the motor. Okay, it's going to be identical. So depending upon which box you have doesn't matter. They both read the same resistance. And I, let me tell you, 214 ohms of resistance when I'm only measuring no higher than 6.1. When I pull that pump, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a nice little burn hole from maybe a surge or, or a possible uh, near lightning strike that went right into that motor. Okay. Now, talking about wire splicing on that previous slide. If, for example, I'm measuring my motor, and I'm measuring above ground, and I measure red to yellow and yellow to black, okay? If I measure red to yellow and it reads in play, say in this case it reads 13 and it should read 12.4 to 13.7. So I'm confident my start's good, but I read yellow to black, and it reads not 214. Let's use a different example. Let's say it reads 11. And I should only measure no more than 6.1. If I'm suspicious of maybe the wire, I know that if the yellow to black is reading high, but yellow to red is not, I watch the black wire. Now let's reverse that. Let's say the start winding is measuring 19, but the, the, the which is yellow to red, but yellow to black is measuring, say, 5.7, which is right in the scale. When now my yellow to red is the high delineator, I would watch my red wire or my red splice. Last thing, if both numbers are measuring weird and you're suspicious of splicing or wire, then I watch the yellow wire, meaning my main is reading 7 ohms and it should only measure 6.1, no higher, and my start winding is measuring say 19 and it should measure more than 13.7. Now I have two high numbers on both the start and the main. The common wire between those two is the yellow. So I would watch my yellow wire or my yellow splice. And what I mean by that too is another way is that when you pull it up the pump, remember cut below the splices, cut the wire clean and recheck the motor. Because if it's the splices, if it's the wire, once you cut those clean, then you'll, you're measuring the motor only, okay? So that's where you do a secondary test at the motor to make sure we could possibly save the motor or not. When you're measuring amps, again, if you don't like to measure voltage, you can measure amps. Now here we're measuring 3.2 amps on the yellow wire, okay? If I look at my chart, if this is a two-wire pump, which it wasn't because we have a yellow wire, yellow wire you always have a three-wire pump because with a two-wire, it's red or black or two black wires or two red wires. With a three-wire pump, it's the only one that's going to have the yellow. It's red to yellow, yellow and black. Remember, windings, so you have a red, a yellow, and a black. Now, let's pretend, though, that that yellow wire was a two-wire motor. If I'm measuring 3.2 and it's a half horsepower, it should measure no more than 4.7 amps. Now, I know I'm pointing to the 4.0, but remember, we can go into the service factor with our pump. 
So the full load is about 4 amps, but we don't want to exceed 4.7. So with our two-wire pump, if it was measuring 3.2, that tells me it's not picking up the full workload. Okay, so we're not too worried. There's our service factor amps. Remember, we don't want to go over the service factor amps. If you're looking at your three-wire pump, this is where you got to look at cap start versus cap run. First one, let's look at the cap start induction run. Now that yellow wire should measure no higher than 6.1 on service factor amps. It's full load is going to be 5.3 which is one column to the left there now the one thing I want to point out look at the red wire on amp load once that motor is started remember the red goes away we don't use the start winding so it should register zero comparatively look at a cap start cap run I don't want to see more than 4.8 amps service factor amps on my yellow I'm measuring 3.2, which 3.2 is even below the 4.2 for the full load amps in that column. But why are the yellow amps so much lower on a cap start cap run versus the top portion there? It's because look at the red. Now the red is staying in play, which is our start winding. It's pulling 1.8 or 1.8 amps uh, to keep the motor running and to keep the torque evenly spread. Because it's helping out, it lowers the amp draw for the whole unit. Okay. Now, where is there an advantage of cap start versus cap run uh, versus induction run? I'll be blunt. For most residences, the amp savings will not equate to savings in the electric bill. Because most residential pumps run maybe 40 minutes a day, if you really think about it. Maybe, okay, Saturday, laundry day, you might run two hours. Okay. But a residential pump does not run much more than about 45 minutes a day. If you're running irrigation, if it's a commercial project, then going to a cap start cap run box can lower the amps and it could possibly give you savings that way, yes. More importantly, here's the big factor. In a residential application, if the homeowner says they hear the pump running all the time and it makes a louder harmonic, by going to a cap start cap run, remember we keep the start winding in play, you can often reduce that harmonic, maybe even eliminate it. So that's what the cap run cap start can help with a residential application. Now uh, we do have a white page on this which I'm hoping to publish and have out on our Facebook page if you want to read more about this subject. Last thing, remember don't overlook your control box. Make sure you have power coming in at L1, L2 proper. As you can see, this control box is not hooked up to anything. Uh, so I'm getting a little residual uh, voltage of 0.171. That's probably what I get for buying a, a cheaper meter. It, the meter is reliable. I shouldn't knock it. I trust these meters. But here I'm measuring L1, L2 to make sure I'm getting voltage to the pump want to thank you for your time and for your patience with me. I do appreciate it. You know, don't be afraid to, to speak up and ask questions. Uh, shoot us emails. Uh, if you'd like to send us an email, you can email us at training.institute at pentair.com. That's training.institute at pentair, P-E-N-T-A-I-R.com. Because uh, I want to remind you that this is your project, not just me. So if there are things you want to see done differently, if you want to see a different subject covered, if there's something that is the pressing question of the day, um, for example, two years ago, mega ohm meters were the big question. How do I use them? Why do I need them? You know, how, how, do you, how do they read? How do I interpret the numbers? So a lot of us, and when I say us, I mean trainers, including my competition, Franklin, all of us, we're teaching people how to use mega ohm meters. If there's anything out there you want to see us cover better, if there's questions you have, feel free to contact us. Uh, and don't uh, be afraid to look into the PLC, the Pentair Learning Center, or our schools. You can go online to find out more information about those at stayright, S-T-A-R-I-T-E.com, or berkeleypumps.com. Uh, this is Dan Featherstone. I thank you very much for listening and for your patience. Have a great day.